this meeting that he and his wife live in Poland. Every week he sends us a poem that he writes. This last couple of weeks he's been writing six or seven poems a day. Yeah. It's hard for me to keep up with him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. one that, uh, one that we have someone read this poem for us. Yeah, I just want to add that Russ is in Michigan right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he's uh, up in the thumb right now, and he said next week he'll be here. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So what I'll read the whole song. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid of evil at all. For the saints on Jesus we can call. He's only a breath away, rescuing us each day. There's much gratitude in my heart when Jesus tells sin to depart. There must be cooperation in me, then I'll be set free. Mm -hmm. This is so marvelous to me. Oh Lord, I long to be. Like King David, I want to be fully thirsting after you. Be a man after your heart, just to be like thou art. Patient, I must be. Letting the Lord take hold of me. Mm -hmm. Then the desired result will be mine. Forever I shall feel mine. Lord, too, will have the glory to you. Amen. And the end, the Lord will have the glory to you. Mm -hmm. Answer. So the children of Israel begin to pray, and the first thing they do is they build an altar. In this altar, they worship God and they honor God. They have a burnt offering to thank God for everything that he has done for them, for his redemptive work from, uh, from Egypt, from Babylon, which is a good thing. All of us should always remember every day, every morning, and thank the Lord for his redemption. Even when the Lord returns and we're in the new Jerusalem, it says the, land, the throne is the throne of the Lamb of God. Right? The Lamb and the Lamb of God. So we always will be reminded of this wonderful redemption. So after they built the altar, they began to work on the foundation. They finished the foundation. And the enemies that were in that area really did not want Jerusalem to be built up because they knew that this was a nation of God. They knew that this would be a powerful nation if God got in control again. So um, they really um, threatened the people of Israel and the people of Israel really got frightened. And so for 20 years, the foundation just was there and there was no temple built. And that's when the prophet Haggai came in to speak to them. Haggai came in in the middle of that and said, what are you doing? Why is your, you building your houses? You're building these beautiful houses and the God, the house of God lieth waste, right? This is 20 years later. And Ezra comes back, and all of a sudden, the people are stirred up again. Don't worry about the enemy. Let's start building the temple. And they did. They started building the temple of God. So the temple is finished. And yet there's a problem. That's when we come to the book of Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, there's this man actually named Nehemiah. He is a cupbearer in the king house of the king, Artaxerxes. And the cupbearer um, is just... He's not a, a ruler, he's not a judge, he's, not, he's just a cupbearer, but it's an important position as far as the king is concerned. So he had to be the one that when the king wanted a drink, he had to be there to give the king a drink, but he also had to taste the drink beforehand to make sure it wasn't poison. He was always there when the king needed to eat, he needed to taste the food, because the king always realized there were enemies, people with poison, so the cupbearer had to put his life on line, but he also became a confidant to the king. The king would speak things among the rulers and the Nehemiah could hear it. So Nehemiah was a trusted person. And then Nehemiah one day was coming out of the the the, uh, the house, the, uh, the palace, and he saw some say his cousin, but anyway, he saw three men that he recognized that had been in Babylon, and there are three that had returned to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah always had it in his heart to be concerned about his people and God's, God's desire, God's longing for the house in Jerusalem. So he went up and he talked to these three men, and they were very honest. They were oh, very open. They gave a true report. There was no lies. There were no lie checking. There was no truth checking. 
They just spoke the truth. And what did they say? They didn't say everything's wonderful. Praise God. We're going on. We're really having a wonderful time. No, they said it's a place. This Jerusalem is a mess. The walls are totally destroyed. The gates, there's no gates. There's almost no way to get in and out of the city. And there's total destruction. There's no place to live. And Nehemiah was grieved in his heart. So what did Nehemiah do? Nehemiah began to pray. What a wonderful thing, right? Instead of just taking action and said, let's go grab his hammer, grab his people and start working and go back and start rebuking the people of Jerusalem. What have you been doing? He didn't do that. He took the way of a spiritual man. He began to pray. He prayed not just a short prayer. He didn't just pray in the morning because he had to, if he wanted to go to Jerusalem, he had to get permission because he worked for the king. He prayed for four months. I believe probably every day when he had time, when he wasn't serving the king, he was on his knees praying, Oh God, what about Jerusalem? This is the place you have chosen. This is where you said you would be glorified. This city, Jerusalem, was called the holy city. And yet the testimony that is being shown to the nations around Jerusalem is nothing. There's nothing there. There's no walls. There's no protection. There's nobody living in the city. The worship in the temple is not going to be working very well because you can't even get in there. There's no way to raise animals. There's no way to bring in the produce. People can't offer. So he prayed for four months, and then he was, he was felt that his prayer was ready to be answered. He went to the king, and he asked leave of the king. king the first thing he realized, the king, he went into the king's house, and the king told him, Nehemiah, I can tell there's something on your heart. Usually you're smiling. I can just say there's something deep within you. It's got to be something inward that's really bothering you. And Nehemiah said, well, this must be the answer to prayer. Because he said, oh, king, the city where my God has chosen, where my people are, where the city that is the people, the city of my people is in total destruction. I really would pray, can you let me go back and work on the city? So Nehemiah is, gets permission from Artaxerxes, but Artaxerxes reminds him, you have to promise, once you go there, you've got to come back. Now they didn't, there was a determined time, but I think that time passed eventually, but we'll see today that Nehemiah had gone back to see the king. So Nehemiah goes back, he sees the situation, he observes it, he tries to go around the city, he sees the total destruction, and he begins to work. Eventually, now, and we're actually at the end of Nehemiah chapter 13. So at this point, Nehemiah begins to talk to the people, and he doesn't look down upon them. He says, he doesn't say, what have you guys been doing? What's wrong with you? Why haven't you known? He said, we, he included himself in this because he considered himself a part of Israel. So he started to speak, we need to begin to build the walls. We need to restore the walls so that the first of all the city will be protected and praise god the people listened to this word and they just began to be open and they began to work on the walls and it was they're not builders many of them were just families and we see in the in the in the uh, nehemiah many families were joined together this family if you read nehemiah it says this family was next to this family this family was next to this family i don't know if you experience sometimes driving down the highway a major highway and you'll see a sign that says this part of the highway is being taken by care of by this family right and then you drive a little further and it says this part of the highway has been taken by this family right <laughs> that's an interesting thing certain families decide we'll keep this clean that's what happened in nehemiah mm -hmm. family after family began to take we will build this wall and when they were building there was an enemy right sam ballot and tobiah they were enemies they were ammonites they were not the people of Israel. And they were constantly against this. First time they saw Nehemiah came, they knew why he was coming. They said, who is this man that's going to build this wall? we got to stop this. They tried. They tried to get Nehemiah to come. He said, no, no, no. I'm not coming to talk to you. I have, I'm too busy. Then they started to slander him. Oh, Nehemiah, we're going to call the king. You're just here to be a king. You want to do this. You want to do that. And they spoke against him. Nehemiah was wise. He didn't get into that fight with them. He just said, look, what you're saying is not true. I'm too busy to argue with you about this. I'm going to keep building. So he kept building, right? Then they tried other ways. They tried to get him 
to come and one of his friends who was part of the temples, who was under, who had been hired by uh, Tobiah to lie to Nehemiah, said, hey, come on, you better live in the temple. You better come hide in here because they're going to kill you. And Nehemiah realized, I'm not a priest, right? I'm not qualified to live in the temple. You want me to sin to protect myself, right? <laughs> you know, today I think we're in that age where, you know, we have to decide whether we're going to be honest and truthful to the word of God. We're going to be honest and truthful to our conscience to stand up for God's word because people are going to begin to judge us and say, well, you're not doing the right thing. You're not political. You're correct. You're not, you're not. What's wrong with you? You don't care about people. Look at you. You're preaching God as the word of God. You're preaching the marriages between man and woman. You're preaching that we should be holy. You're preaching that you uh, need to live a life that's pleasing to God. And they're going to start speaking against you and talking against you, right? And we need to be bold to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to sin just to protect myself. I'm going to stand one with the Lord. We'll be challenged this way. So eventually we realize the wall got built. Praise God. <laughs> and chapter 12 of Nehemiah is the chapter we covered two weeks ago. Uh, Brother Bruce shared this chapter. And chapter 12 is a wonderful, praising, singing, glorying uh, chapter because now it is the dedication of the wall. They're dedicating the finished wall. The gates are built. The wall is built. They can protect the city. The temple is there. People have moved into the city, right? Earlier chapter, they got people to choose to live and live in the city, take care of the city. People are now outside the city. The ones who lived out there, they're we're bringing produce, they're bringing their animals, they're bringing ways for God to be worshipped. Praise the Lord, right? What a wonderful thing to praise God for, right? So we see the choirs. There's two choirs. It says one goes on the wall to the east, one goes to the west, and they surround the city on the walls. And what are they doing? They're singing. They're praising God. They're thanking Him. Glory be to God. Worship you, God, for such a wonderful God. And they had this wonderful praise and worship and it says the sound of their singing the sound of their praising was heard throughout all the lands so all the enemies tobias and Bala, all the other people could hear this shouting and singing and worshiping the lord they hadn't heard this for a long time but it was so wonderful <laughs> then and now we come to chapter 13 chapter 13 we begin I titled this here, The Word, and Follow It. So um, just to talk a little bit about chapter 13, when I first came to chapter 13, on the one hand, I was a little bit, I was kind of discouraged <laughs> when I read chapter 13 because all of a sudden it's, there's problems again, the same old problems. They were still mixing with foreigners. Ezra dealt with this. When Ezra first went to, to Jerusalem, he saw the people of Israel, especially even some of the, the leaders, the, the priests and so forth, had intermarriage with the people of the nations. And in Deuteronomy, they're told, don't mingle with the foreigners. Don't marry them, right? You're bringing in the uh, leaven into the, into the, into the, the uh, people of Israel, right? You bring mixture. We don't want that, right? And so it was dealt with in Nehemiah's time. Right? The same thing happened early in Nehemiah. They, they were marrying foreigners. And, they had to, and by the Lord's grace and through the word of God, they started putting away their foreigners. But we'll see in this chapter, chapter 13, in one portion of the chapter, Nehemiah speaks that he had already gone back to the king Artaxerxes. So by this time, between chapter 12 and chapter 13, Nehemiah has been gone from Jerusalem for approximately 12 years. So Nehemiah, he was faithful. He went back to work with the king, to tell the king what was going on, to work with the king. And now it's 12 years later, and he comes back, and he sees the situation. And this is what it says. So I have this uh, verse from Luke to introduce us into hearing the word and follow it, because we do see uh, the people reacting to the word of God. So... Um, Ted, can you read Luke eleven twenty eight in the first verse? But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those that hear the word of God 
and Paul. This is Jesus speaking to the people, right? He says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and what? Follow it, right? So we do see a, a wonderful transaction in this portion when we come to Hebrews chapter 13. I'll read chapter 13, verse 1 to you. <clears throat> On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud as the people listened. So this is a, seems to be a tradition that they started. They started this back when the people desired for the word of God to be read. And Ezra stood up for seven days and was reading the word. So again, they're still in some ways continuing with us. So on that day, the book of Moses was read aloud and the people listened. Wonderful. And there was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite was ever to enter the assembly of God. Verse 2, because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. So I, I don't want to get into the story of Balaam and Balak, but um, Balak had hired um, Balaam to curse the people of Israel, right? And we know the story on the way to bring the curse of his donkey. I saw an angel start speaking, right? And Balaam realized, i, I got to be careful here. So when he eventually got there, he actually blessed the people, right? Because the Lord said, I'm not going to let them be blessed. It says, however, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So here it says what? In verse 3. So when they heard the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. So this is why I uh, put this word. They heard the word and they followed it. From the right at the very beginning, foreigners were still there. They had Ammonites. They had Moabites coming in. And they were not supposed to be part of them. So when they heard the word of God, they responded in a healthy way. They said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to put foreigners out. Then we're going to see later that it even was worse than this. So what do we do with this? <laughs> Today, what should we do? We're the church. We're Christians. We're believers. Should we, should we not let believers come into the church? Should we not let foreigners, people who are not with us, come to the church? Well, they shouldn't participate in the Lord's table. They shouldn't be participate. But this is why I have the next section verses. Could you take me to the next slide, please? All right. You notice I have two sections. One is Ruth, and one is Ephesians. Why did I bring this up? What are they told in, in what are they told in thirteen one? Do not let any Ammonite or Moabite be part of us. So what are we gonna do? On one hand, yes, I would like to say this. The church is really the true body of Christ is only compromised with people who are born again. Just because you go to church, you go to a church building or you attend a meeting. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not a member of the body of Christ. You may go, you may look like you are, but inwardly you have not been changed. You are still a Gentile. You are still a Moabite. <laughs> you are still an Ammonite. You have no participation in what the church is doing. We just broke the Lord's table. This table this bread, this cup, is only for those who have confessed, repented of their sins, and believe in Jesus Christ. You are qualified to partake of this loaf and drink this cup. So we don't allow people who are unbelievers, if we know they're unbeliever, we'll ask them, please, we're happy you're here, but please do not partake of the table or the loaf, because you're not a believer. This is faithful to the truth of the word. And yet, we see this in Ruth, we know the story of Ruth. You know what nationality Ruth was? Ruth was a Moabite. <laughs> Ruth had no part of the children of Israel. And yet, listen to this. It says, Ruth, then she said, this is when, you know, I, again, I don't want to get in the story of Ruth, but um, Naomi was a Jew. And she, she and her husband and her two sons left Jerusalem and went to Egypt 
to the land, actually, yeah, to the land of the Moabites, and the two sons married uh, two Moabite women. And the famine was over, the sons died, the father died, and now all that was left was Ruth and her two daughter-in-laws. So Naomi found out that the famine was over in Jerusalem, so she decided, I need to go back to my people. If I'm going to survive, I need to go back, live with my family, my relatives. But then there was says, uh, then it said, and behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her small gods. Return after your sister-in-law, right? Go back to your gods. This is you live here. This is your people. But this is wonderful. Ruth says, do not plead with me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you sleep, I will sleep. This is the key. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Right there we see Ruth made a decision that she was no longer a Moabite. <laughs> she became a child of God. She became by choosing to leave her gods, leave her land, join herself to God, and join herself to his people and stay with Naomi. It says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and worse, if anything but death departs from me. How was this Moabite able to be part of Jerusalem? She repented. <laughs> she turned away from her nationality. She turned away from her gods. Today, brothers and sisters, the church must continue to preach the gospel. Amen. We don't just need to sit here and say, we're, we're going to hide in here. We're going to be afraid of everything. We're going to stay in here. We're going to cluster together. And we're going to just protect our little, our Jesus. We're going to protect our lives. But no, the Lord Jesus is looking <laughs> for people to come to him that worship other gods. They worship the devil. They worship so many things. And yet through the gospel, they can eventually say, your God is my God. Your people are my people. What a wonderful saying. This is why I put Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we read this morning already. It says, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. You know, just won't take too long to look around the room. A couple seconds, you look around the room. <laughs> the only person you can look to is there's a brother sitting back here at the table named Steve Miller who was born a Jew. According to Deuteronomy, he's the only one that's allowed to be here. <laughs> you can kick us all out, Steve, right? None of us would have been allowed to be part of the children of Israel. We were all Gentiles. <clears throat> this is what Paul says in Ephesians 2. At that time, you're separated from Christ. Listen, excluded from the people of Israel. Ted, you, you're not allowed to be here. Oh, how we... <laughs> we were we were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in this world. Right? right? None of us in this room were qualified. We, if we were in <clears throat> Nehemiah at that time, we'd have to be kicked out. Right? We'd have to be put out of the city. But listen to this, verse thirteen. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Isn't that worth something worshiping and singing about? Praise God. We made the choice. We made the decision. Each one of us, you can look at your own lives, how you became a Christian, when you became a Christian, whether you're young, you're older, right? Whatever, no matter what, raised in a Christian home, not raised in a Christian home, you were, well, we were all born in sin. We all were sinful. We all live sinful lives. But one day the gospel came to us and the Holy Spirit convicted us and we believed in him and we said, Lord, I repent. Thank you for your blood that washed me. All of a sudden, you're no longer a Moabite. You're no longer a Gentile. You're now a member of the household of God. Amen. We read further in this verse, which I didn't have there. It says, on the cross, he broke down the wall between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he made peace. <laughs> Praise God. This is why I'm sharing this, because today the church needs to preach the gospel and bring in those who are Moabites, those who are Gentiles, 
through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased. Remember, Steve, uh, a few months ago, our brother Steve Miller said, told us he's going to write a track, right? And he's going to write a track, and he's going to go house to house and pass out these tracks, right? Around here, around there. Remember you said that? Yeah. Then you stood up in the meeting a couple weeks later and said, the Lord told me I should write a track. You remember that? Oh, yeah. And I asked you, well, when are you going to do it? <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Steve took that word, and the next, next week he wrote a track. And you'll see later at the end of the meeting, he's, he and some other brothers have walked three square miles, passing out tracks house to house. I don't know, maybe this young couple sitting here, maybe you got one of those tracks. No? You missed one, Steve. <laughs> well, I thought maybe that's why you came. But anyway, that's the gospel. The Lord stirred up Steve and some other brothers in their spirit to go out. How, how effective the tracks will be, whether it works or not, we don't know. But the Lord said, sow the seed. When you sow the seed, you shall come with rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. If you do not sow the seed, we do not preach the gospel, then there's no way for people to be saved. So praise God for that wonderful thing. Why don't we go to the next, next slide? So the wonderful thing is that people heard the word of God and they put out the foreigners, but it even gets worse. It even gets worse. All right. This is our heart, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what 1 Corinthians 6, 1 says. It says, do you not know that your heart is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Um, Ephesians 3.16 says this. Remember at one time, sorry, I'm reading the wrong verse. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his, of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So these two verses, we realize that Christ Jesus, when we became a Christian, through the spirit, he wants to dwell in our heart. He wants us as believers to be his very dwelling place. So to be a dwelling place of God, to be the temple, or listen to that verse, our heart is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Should we be filling our heart with other things? Should we allow other things to come in our heart to push Jesus out of our heart a little bit? Should we hide some rooms in our, in our heart and say, this is for me? Jesus, you can have this part, but you can't have this part, right? This is what happened in Nehemiah. All right. This is pretty small print. I don't know. If you can, are you able to read that mic up there or not? Which part? Uh, Nehemiah 13. That's too small, I can read it. Now, prior to this, Elisha, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah, had prepared a large room for him, where previously they used to put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the utensils, and the tithes of grains, wine, and oil, described for the Levites, the singers, and the gatekeepers, and the contributions of the priests. But during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the third and second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had come to the king. After some time, however, I requested a leave of absence from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Elisha had committed for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courtyard of the house of God. Can you read it? It was very displeasing yeah. to me, so I threw all of Tobiah's household articles out of the room. Then I gave an order, and they cleansed the rooms, and I returned the utensils to the house of God there with the grain offering and frankincense. So we here see something even further that was just more than just they were allowing Moabites and Ammonites to live in the city and be part of the city. Listen, it says Elisha. The priest. This is the priest of the holy temple. This is the priest of the temple of God. What did he do? He, we, we find out that he is actually a relative of Tobiah. You know who Tobiah is? Tobiah is an Ammonite. He's not even supposed to be in the city. Now we found him in the temple. 
You know who Tobiah is? He was the very enemy throughout all of the building of the wall, the temple. Everything was fighting against Nehemiah the whole time. <laughs> he was the enemy of God. And this priest says, Tobiah, you're my relative. Come on, I have a room for you. Right? It wasn't just a room in the, in, in the house. He said, well, where am I going to? Tobiah asked, well, well this I'm adding to this. Tobiah is going to ask where I live. Well, I have a wonderful room. It's where we store the, the grains. We store the things that, for us to worship God. We store, we, 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 what do we store in here? Frankincense, utility, tithes of grain, wine, and sky. The things that the people brought in to take care of the Levites and the singers. Oh, we'll just move that out. And you can move in, right? This is the dwelling place of God. This is where the Shekinah glory of God fell. This is where God said, I will meet with my people. And here, this priest is inviting Tobiah, an Ammonite, an unbeliever. Move right in. It's yours. Anything you want is yours. Well, when I read this, and this is where it says, it tells us Nehemiah was out of, I was not around. It's verse 6 it says, but during all this time, I was not in Jerusalem. From the 22nd of the year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had come to the king. So now he's saying, I asked the king to come back. This is a 12-year period. And when he comes back, <laughs> he finds, <clears throat> how can things really be that bad? <laughs> right? How can it really be that bad? And this priest is let Tobiah, my enemy, and Hamanite move in to the temple of God. So, and then what did he say? He said, it was very disgusting to me. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad Nehemiah didn't change. He was disgusted. Are we disgusted with the unbelieving things that are coming into the church, the body of Christ? Are we disgusted that people are allowing evil to come into the so-called church? I just read this morning that the first transgender Lutheran bishop has been become a bishop in the Lutheran church. One part of the Lutheran church, not the evangelical. Isn't that a Tobiah? Okay, let's go even deeper. So what is what is what does Nehemiah do? He says, so I threw all of Tobiah's household articles out of the room. He wasn't nice. We'll talk about this later. Jesus did something similar in the temple, right? He says, then I gave an order and they cleansed the room. They realized this having this, we need to clean this room. We need to purify it. The Holy Spirit needs to come. The word of God needs to come and cleanse this room, right? And I returned the utensils of the house of God there with the grain offerings and frankincense. He took care of it. He was concerned about taking care of the house of God. So I would ask you, and I, I ask myself when I think about this even deeper, I can talk about what Lutherans do. I can talk about what Episcopalians might do, what other people might do. Then the Lord would ask me, how about you, Rick? How about you? Have you brought things into your temple, into your heart that are not pleasing to me? And I have to, I have to confess, I have at times I have and I just realized this is an uh, experience I had starting in well it's for many many years started many many years ago but in 2019 the end of two, uh, the summer of 2019 um, this is just something personal in my own heart my own life I decided to deal with this I decided this is this is this is not right I can minister the saints. I can share these things. But when I have this thing in my heart, it's like I'm moving frankincense, myrrh, things out of, the, out of my heart that are for the saints that I can't give to them because that room is occupied. It took me, I, I spent at least a year, actually a little over a year, to deal with this situation in my, in my own being, through prayer, through, through fellowship, through counseling, different things like that from other brothers. And eventually the Lord routed this thing out of my being right? <laughs> to the place where I could say, Lord, thank you. I had to get tough. I had to get tough like Tobiah. I mean, like Nehemiah, cast it out, right? Throw it out. Just like 
Jesus says, Lord, if you've got something to offend you, pluck your right hand off. Pluck out your eye. Of course, physically, you don't really do that. But he was showing the seriousness of defiling our temple. This temple, my temple, with things that are not pleasing to God. Ammonites, Moabites. So praise God, I was able to do that. I was able to throw this out. I was able to get rid of it. So I can look back and look at, oh, what's wrong with the children of Israel? What's wrong with Elijah? And the Lord says, prior to this, Rick, an elder in the church, appointed some chambers of his house to, to buy it. I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> Am I willing to deal with those things? Am I willing to throw these things out? So we go to the next slide. This next slide will speak of... <clears throat> This is from 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is Paul writing to Timothy. It says, Nevertheless, the solemn foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, from those things of clay, those things of wood, those things of dishonor, if anyone cleanses from these things, he will be what? A vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Basically, what Elisha had done is that he made the temple, that part of the temple, not useful. He took in what we would say now, wood, hay, and stubble. The priests, the Levites, the singers, we'll see later, didn't have their portion. So what did they, later, we'll just see in a few minutes, they had to go back to their jobs. And they, I mean, they had to go back to the fields. They had to feed their families. You can't blame them, right? But they were being dishonored. They weren't being taken care of. But praise God, brothers and sisters, we're still alive in this age. This the church, the house, is filled with a lot of vessels. But we need to choose what kind of vessels we want to be. If we want to say we're known by him, then we have to just put away those depart from iniquity. We need to cleanse our vessels. I believe everyone in this room wants to be a vessel useful to the master. For his good works. Praise God. Thank you for that. All right. I'll spend a little bit more time. I know we started a little bit later and we're here a lot of times and my kids are probably getting tired. <laughs> um, let's go to the next slide. So just remember these things, saints. Yes, we're reading about Israel. We're reading about their weaknesses. But go to the Lord about your own. Don't just point your finger. <laughs> but look into our own selves. As Paul charges us before we take the table, he always tells us, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Okay, I mean, this is why has the house of God been neglected? <laughs> this is another portion. There's like five things <laughs> Nehemiah is dealing with this in the chapter. The foreigners, <laughs> Tobiah, right? And now he's talking about the Sabbath, right? The fourth thing will be, uh, we'll get to it. Um, the fourth thing is, look on my sheet. Yeah, the sanctity, the Sabbath, and the fifth, I guess the next one is still mixed marriages. So here, remember in, the, in Nehemiah chapter 10, the declaration of the children of Israel? Don, can you, or Don, can you read this? Uh, Nehemiah 10, 39, the verse at the top. Can you see that or not? Uh, yeah. Um, For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contributions of grain, um, of grain, uh, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers of the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, uh, the gatekeepers, and the singers, and there. Um, so we shall not neglect the house of our God. Amen. It's a wonderful chapter, right? <laughs> All the things they start bringing the grains, the very place <laughs> to buy it live, they filled, but they got kicked out. But here, what did they say at the end? 
So we will not neglect the house of our God. Right? Isn't that their promise? Didn't you promise when you became a Christian, you followed the Lord many times in my Christian life? Lord, I promise I will never do that again. I will honor you. I will love you. I won't say that. I won't say this. I won't look at that TV show. I won't do this. I promise many times. Sincerely, right? <laughs> but listen to what it says in uh, Nehemiah chapter uh, 13, verse 10. It says, I also discovered the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away each to his own field. So nobody's taking care of the Levites. There, nobody's taking care of them. And he said, so I reprimanded the officials and said, why has the house of God been neglected? Mm. Not long before they said, we'll never neglect the house of God. <laughs> and yet they neglected the house of God. How did they neglect it? By not taking care of one another. By not taking care of the singers, not taking care of the Levites, not ministering to the needs of one another. This is not just, um, it's practically, even, even with finance, even taking care of those, even the word tells us those who are oxen, you know, you need to feed them, nourish them, right? And, but also practically nourishing, whether we take a meal to someone or serve someone or call them up and pray with them, we take care of them. We worship them. We not worship, we worship the God. But our real care for one another is our love for one another. But it was being neglected. And Nehemiah says, you're neglecting the house. You neglect the people. You neglect the brothers and sisters. This building means nothing. Right? What, what you build up, your ministry means nothing. What you have means nothing. If you neglect the very people who you should be caring for. Mm -hmm. We need to be very careful. So he says, why are you neglecting the house of God? <clears throat> and they said, then I gathered them together and stationed them at their post. All Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, the wine, the oil, and the storehouse to be in charge of the storehouse. So you can see the people saw what the priest was doing. They saw him move to buy in. They saw what they had offered before was just being strewn away. And they're starting to say, well, why should we offer why should we give money? Come let Elisha, the priest, just throw it out and not use it according to what, for the Lord's ministry, for the gospel, right? It's a sad case. We can give story after story of many people who have done this with the, Lord, with the Lord's money and the people's money, where you can see the people get discouraged. We can tell many stories. But then he did this. To be, and so he began to bring people in. He says, to be in charge of the storehouse, I appointed Shemla, the priest, Zadak, the scribe, and Padiah from the Levites. In addition to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Matina. <clears throat> or what? They were considered reliable. And it was their task to distribute to their kinsmen. Then he says, remember me thus, my God, do not wipe out my loyal deeds, which I perform for the house of my God. So what did Nehemiah do? And he just did not only did he take care of the needs of putting the things back in, but he found some faithful men who were reliable to take care of the needs of the people. Very similar to Acts chapter 6, right? When the, the um, Hellenistic um, widowers, widows were complaining. They weren't getting the same food. They weren't getting... What did the, what did the apostles do? They said, fine, Seven faithful men who are powerful, full of the Holy Spirit, and know the Word of God, right? The church needs people, not just people because they know how to swing a hammer or they know how to use a broom. They know how business and all that. Fine, that's good. But if they just know business, they know how to do these things, it's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for those who spend time, are reliable, are filled with the Spirit, pray for one another, encourage one another. So Nehemiah is doing all this restoration work. We need to spend time with this. We need to spend time to take care of this experience. I don't know if I'm, what do you think? Should I keep going or do you want me to stop? <laughs> think it's enough, Steve? <laughs> There's a big thing about the Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll get to the. Let's just go to the next slide. Yeah, let's stop. Let's just start. Well, I'm not going to read this verse, but this the reason I put this verse up before the Sabbath. And you'll see Jesus, when he came to the temple, he saw people uh, selling and doing things in the temple, in the courtyard where they weren't supposed to be. And Jesus did what Nehemiah did. He started overthrowing the tables and he cast them out. And when he said, you're making my house of prayer, the Lord's God's house of prayer, into a den of robbers. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what's happening in the next. Let's go to the next slide. So we need to sanctify the Sabbath day. So again, we see Nehemiah sees a problem in the Sabbath. Um, and I'll just go through real quickly. Uh, it says, in those days I saw in Judah people who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing sacks of grain, loading them on donkeys as well as wine grapes, every kind of load, and they were bringing them to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. I also, verse 16, saw people of Tyre, living there, importing fish, merchandise they were selling on the Sabbath day. They were doing, selling these things, and the Jews <coughs> were coming to buy these things, purchasing these things, right? <laughs> Already, they weren't supposed to do this. The Sabbath day was supposed to be sanctified, holy, unto God. You're not supposed to be doing business. So what does Nehemiah do? He takes all these people, and he says, get out of here. And he casts them out of the city. He closes the gate, Right? And he says, you can't come in here on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to dishonor God in your heart. You're not allowed to dishonor our sanctified God. And then the people are still outside. He tells them. He goes outside and tells them, what are you hanging around the walls for? Get away from here. If you don't get away from here, I'm going to do something really. I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> so all the people got scared and they left. Right? And then what did he do in verse 22? Nehemiah says, and I ordered the Levites that they were to purify themselves and come as gatekeepers to what? To sanctify the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, the Levites had to purify themselves. They had to become those who could sanctify and guard the gates of Jerusalem. And then let's go to the next slide because I have these verses. This is for us. Uh, let's go one more. One more slide. There we go. This is this is from First Peter, Proverbs, and Psalms. First Peter three fifteen says, "But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts." Then Proverbs four twenty three says, "Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of your out of it springs the issues of life." So what did Nehemiah tell them in Jerusalem, he asked the Levites to purify themselves, guard the gates, guard the gates. Don't let anybody in on the Sabbath. We're charged to guard the gates of our temple, and that's our heart. Keep your heart with diligence, Peter says, for out of it is the spring's issues of life. It's in our inner being. It's our inner word within word being that the Lord Jesus dwells. If we don't guard our heart, and we let anybody come in and do whatever they want, we let things come in us, and we spend time on things that are taking away from honoring the Lord, we are, just, we are not taking care of the Sabbath. We're not sanctifying the Sabbath. We're not sanctifying this life within. And then Proverbs says, keep your heart with all diligence, right? Guard your heart, guard the gate of your being. Right, for it's a spring of life. And Psalm 119 says, how, how about, um, who can read this? Uh, Johnson, can you read Psalm 119, please? Mm -hmm. 9 through 11. How can a young man cleanse his way? So I take the heat according to your words. With my whole heart, I have sought. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your world I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Amen. Remember the title of this message? Hear the word and follow it. How do we guard our hearts? How do we keep our hearts? How can a young man cleanse his way? Uh, by taking heed to your word. 
With my whole heart I've sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's through the word of God. It's through the word and through the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the last uh, sheet with a conclusion because I this is a good conclusion again. My conclusions are verses. Let's, we're going to skip the mixed marriages. We know we shouldn't have mixed marriages. Um, which I, What I mean is Christian with an unbeliever. <laughs> it's not mixed marriages as far as believers and believers or nationality. That would be that. It's the foreigner who is not a believer. Okay, so this is a conclusion. My conclusion is the only thing, and I think we've seen this in Nehemiah, the only thing that saved the people was the word of God and the work of the Spirit. Amen. <laughs> the only thing, brothers and sisters, that's going to save us, save the church from destruction, save the church from falling into the pits, is the word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. And of course, we realize, included in that, is prayer. But we need the word of God. So I have this conclusion with two verses. The first two verses, or the first two section of verses are related to the word, and the last two are related to the spirit. There's many more verses. But listen to this, Ephesians 5, 25. And we sang the last song about longing for the bride. This is what this talks about. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. For why? So that he might sanctify and cleanse her. How? With the washing of water in the word. How are we cleansed from our sins? How are we cleansed from the defilement of the flesh? How are we cleansed from the Tobiah moving into the temple? How are we cleansed to keep the Sabbath day? It's through the word of God. And it says that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So I would encourage us saints here in this room on Zoom, or if anybody listens to this message or hears it, honor the word of God. Spend time in the word. Be washed in the word of God. We may think we're okay, but the word of God is good for correction, for enlightenment, for shining. There may be things that we don't know. Hebrews 4 says, the word of God is living and sharp and hot, and dividing the soul and spirit, piercing to the soul and spirit, the things you don't need, even the thoughts and intents of your heart. Sometimes we don't know the thoughts and intents, but the word of God is able to penetrate. And we're able to come to the throne of grace and find time. Then Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father for him. So again, when we let the word of God dwell in us richly, things begin to happen. We begin to sing. We begin to take care of one another. We have hymns, spiritual songs. We have grace. Why were they able to sing on the temple walls? Why were they able to be such joyful? Because the word of God had spoken to them and they listened to it. If the church follows the word of God, no matter how depressed this world gets, no matter how discouraging the world attacks the church, if we keep the word of God in our hearts, we'll find ourselves still singing, crazy, worshiping God deep within. Remember when Saul and Paul were thrown in jail? What were they doing? They were singing. <laughs> Remember the stories, if you've read about the martyrs, when they're tied to the thing and burning, or the lions are going to eat them, what are they doing? They're singing. <laughs> they're singing songs worshiping God because the Holy Spirit in the Word is much more real than what is happening to them, and they know their eternal life is with them. And not only that, it says the Word in the Holy Spirit. John 16, 8 says, And he, and I put in parentheses, this means the Holy Spirit, when he comes, the Spirit will convict the world regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. Again, I'd like to point out it's the Holy Spirit that works in us that cleanses us, that speaks to us. If I have a Tobiah moved into my heart, the Holy Spirit, I pray many times for the Lord, unveil me. I want to live a godly life. Reveal to me. And eventually the Holy Spirit began to show me where I needed to work. And I thank the Holy Spirit because that was his work. That's his job. That we would be convicted concerning righteousness, sin and righteousness. 
And then Ephesians 5, 18, another wonderful thing happens when you're filled with the Spirit. It says, be filled with the Spirit. You're not by yourself. Speaking to one another. Amen. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Very similar to Colossians. Giving thanks for always, for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. The word of God speaks to each one of us, can cause us to begin to work in our hearts. But the word of God also brings us in fellowship with one another, to take care of one another. Yes. The word of God also, when it's spoken, it causes us to sing and worship and be spoken to. When the spirit comes, the spirit causes us to love one another, care for one another, minister to one another. We see this throughout Nehemiah. When the word came, they responded. But many times they kept falling back and forth. But praise God. Today, brothers and sisters, our answer to all of this is let's spend time in the word. Let's preach the gospel. <clears throat> let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak. Let us never get away from the work of the Spirit and the word of God. Amen. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for patience in the problems with the technology. Um, if anybody wants to share something or pray, we can do that, and we'll have some announcements. I'd just like to say, uh, we, look, go over, we, we look back on these. Uh, Here, you have to. Oh. There. <laughs> okay. We look back on these verses, and we see that. Uh, you don't have to hold it. Oh, okay. That's fine. We see that uh, times have not changed much. Yeah. Uh, st still face the same problems. The uh, Jews, the Israelites, fell away from God, and then God would send uh, a, a prophet or someone, and they get all fired up and yell and cry and put ashes on their heads and so on and so forth. And six months later, they're back doing the same thing again. And uh, or, for, or for years to come, so God would have to send somebody else to remind them of the law, remind them of, of the word. Well, I just, heard, I just heard a wonderful message, and I'm going to be faithful all week. <laughs> or at least until this afternoon. Yeah, wow. uh, you know, but, but that's the reason why we need the church. One of the reasons we need the church. Yes. We need the church to, 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 to build each other up, uh, to uh, re remind each other of what it means to serve the Lord. To encourage each other, uh, it's, uh, to, we need to support and and aid Christ in building His church. Mm -hmm. We cannot do without each other. I I need your help. You need mine. You don't have everything. I don't have everything. But I have something you need, and you have something I need. Right. And uh, there, that's uh, the importance of uh, the church. And we shouldn't have to have to get all built up just by the message on Sunday, and then that's it. That's, that we, we should help each other all week and uh, help each other sustain our faith. Amen. I don't know if the church can hear me. We can hear you great. Yeah. Okay. I very seldom speak, but I take lots of notes. I would kind of like to share a few of my notes, if that's okay. Great. So, based on the Bible verses that um, we went over today, um, specifically in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 2, where it talks about how God turns curses into blessings, I would just like to say, several years ago, God did that for me, and to this day, I'm still being blessed. <laughs> and I think it's important that we remember those times. I, I mean, we live in a world where we're never, we're never going to escape people who, no matter what we do, you know, are going to want to wish us harm. But I just want to encourage people to to look for the blessing amongst, you know those curses they're there and i've been going on now 10 years of being blessed as a result of god doing this for me um also talking about ruth 
how Ruth was a Moabite and gave up, you know, being one. Um, I have written down, we like Ruth need to give up and turn away from our old life, our old beliefs, our habits, our patterns, our old self with its individual nature, or I mean sinful nature, and embrace our new life in Christ. We need to put on our new selves and to resist that urge to go back to our old ways. And I don't think that urge will ever go away. At least it hasn't for me. Um, and it's in direct conflict with what pleases the Lord. We can't participate in both sin and righteousness. In other words, we can't both be a Moabite and a Jew. And then, well, there's more, but I want to give somebody else a chance to talk. <laughs> I think that's a good place to stop. Mm -hmm. I just to kind of re 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 remind all of us that then um, yeah, next, next week we hear a little bit about, about the conference that was um, really was brought out really, really boldly because um, I love how they even mentioned like, no matter how this world is, we need to be sower of seeds. Yes. Not just only preaching the gospel, that's part of sower of the seeds. But this would remind us how the Lord, um, I always think it with, the, um, it with the young people, that's how I started with the young people. And I, I always love how, um, how in one of the songs says, the Lord is a jealous God. He wants us to be his bride. Mm -hmm. But he said, um, I, I remember the conference, I hope, hope we take the opportunity for next week to continue. But um, what really, really struck me the most was um, we need to be sower of seeds, but we need to help each other to be sower of seeds for others. But it really shows that, that um, like when, when we we're going over um, last weekend, he said, um, Isaac, he said, bring wood and build his house. What that means is um, look, look, it's not a small matter to be sower of seeds. Well, we should always take the example from what we just read. That um, even though we could be sower of seeds, but there's opportunities for Lord could really spread, Lord could really grow in us. So when we're sower of seeds, He's able to um, push Himself through people, through others. Look how many centuries of uh, uh, Paul, how many five thousand, ten thousand. Because the Lord is so effective. He, he's so, he's, he's always right there, but I love the song that says, I'm a jealous guy, but I love you so much. Like, but this world's always going to be one thing against us. But it's like, but when we work together, when we love each other, yes. when we're so we're up seeds, things could happen. Things could, um, like, towards the end, where it says, um, they were rejoiced because they were bringing, bringing the best of the best, no matter what the world throws at us. But he said, "Don't forget." I always remember when, when they ended um, last week Sunday. He said, "Don't forget, you are sower of seeds." Brother, did you want to introduce your family here? Would you like to introduce your family? Hi, I'm David. Uh, this is Michelle. Uh, this is our daughter, Winifred, and father, Winnie, and this is Alvin. Yeah. We heard you were in Tesla for five years. But yeah, we, we were teaching at a, at a Christian international school. Oh, for the past five very years. good. So, Hello, we're from Michigan originally. Okay. Are you back living or are you still brought back? Yeah, we're we're back for at least two years now. Okay. So but uh, yeah, so it was it's nice to meet 
for you to walk in the same Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to get with me. Um, yeah. Um, yep. You need to speak for here. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can bring it over there if you need to. Oh, okay. Yeah, Rick, Rick's going to bring up the announcements. Okay, we have the Zoom prayer meeting on Tuesday. 7 30 to 8 30 just on zoom right now our continued reading now we just finished the book of nehemiah so now we're going on to the book of malachi so our net reading for this next week is malachi chapter one we have a bar a bible study in farmington hills it was 7 30 to 8 30 we changed it to 7 to 8 30 because we weren't getting enough we weren't covering enough so it's now it's 7 to 8 30 and we finished the book of Proverbs, so now we moved on to the book of Ecclesiastes. And that's that you can join by Zoom or in person. And then our next hybrid joint meeting with the Chinese speaking is on the end of this month, September 26th at 10. Mind you about Bruce's email Bible study group. They're going sequentially through the whole Bible. They're at the near the end of Acts now. And then go to the next slide for the gospel flyer status. So here's what we've covered so far on the area near this uh, church building. We've covered three square miles and almost through with the, that little last half square mile. So that goes from middle belt to, um, to Levan. And after we finish that little bit, the next area is going to be Madonna College. So... Well, we're, I think we'll give, we're going to give them out to Madonna College. Also, Thomas and I, Thomas wanted to do his old neighborhood where he, where he grew up. It's over by Gill Road. So Thomas and I did a couple streets there. And also, Chris Fritz and I did Dearborn also. And I was dog sitting this week uh, in Royal Oak for my daughter. So when I was walking the dog, I put gospel tracks on the cars. <laughs> so, and, and since that's kind of far away, Royal Oak, I didn't use the flyer, but I used the gospel tracks that we got in the lobby. It's better to put them on the house, but that dog, I'm not able to direct them that well to go to each house. So I just put them on the, on the cars. If you do put them on cars, put them on the driver's side so that the person, when they get in, they can get it easily. And... I also have another idea for the gospel now, and this is because I is yard signs. So we could have a yard sign that says, you know, I go to the church in Livonia. Uh -huh. I wish you could come to something like that, uh -huh. and a gospel verse on it too. So let's see. I got to figure out how much that'll cost and all that. And. I think that's it, right, Rick? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so we'll just end with prayer. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just wanted to say with, with the message, I was touched about, well, two, th two things especially. One is how Tobiah was given a large room in the temple. Yeah. And that's like giving Satan a space in the church. And that's what's happening today in, yeah. in the church at large. And why did they do that to, for Tobiah? Well, Tobiah was was always causing trouble. Now they got peace with Tobiah. Well, you know, wow, what a <laughs> what a, you think? Wow, I may I got peace now. I don't have any problem. But you lost the Lord. <laughs> and then the other thing I was touched about is about Rick shared about those martyrs. They were singing when they were martyred. Right. So I thought you better know hymns by heart, right. so that right. in case you are right. <laughs> in case you're in prison, you can sing these hymns. Right. And then, then I'll just pray, Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. Lord. Uh, Lord, thank you for the meeting today, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, uh, cover all the um, fiascos we had with the technology, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, uh, pray that we could would be following the word, Lord, mm -hmm. like like Nehemiah and, and the brothers of the Old Testament, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, that uh, we would hear the word and follow it, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, pray uh, if there's any rooms for satan in our hearts or in the church lord that you expose them lord Amen. lord and uh we take the time for the sabbath rest lord to Amen. to uh to examine our lives and, and and rest in you and enjoy you lord 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.